will a God of love finally take those who don't believe in him and throw them into hell where they will burn forever and ever? Is this a biblical fact or a myth? We're about to find out on His Voice today. Welcome to another His Voice Today with Steve Wolber. Welcome to the Hot Topic of Hell, Part 2. Let me just quickly review some of the things we talked about in Part 1. We're discussing what the Bible says and doesn't say about hell. And we looked up Matthew chapter 13, verse 40, where Jesus clarified that there is a real fire, but that it will burn at the end of the world. We also looked up 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, where Peter said the same thing, that the atmosphere and the earth itself will burn up on the day of judgment at the end of the world. Uh, we also looked at the book of Revelation, chapter 20, that describes the thousand-year period, and in verses 11 to 15, John saw in vision the lost being resurrected at the end of the millennium, and then they are judged, and then they are thrown into the lake of fire for their punishment. And all of these verses tell us that uh, there is a real fire, but it's not burning now. It's coming in the future uh, on the day of judgment and at the end of the world. Now, most people, when they think about hell, that's really not what they think. They imagine or believe that hell is a fiery place way down under the ground, somewhere down below our feet, where the lost are burning right now, and where the lost souls of those that don't believe in God, they go down there at the point of death to suffer. Some believe that the devil's down there, that his demons are down there, and that they are literally torturing people with some kind of instruments like pitchforks. But the fact is that there really is no verse in the New Testament, except for one, which we'll look at in a moment, that really teaches this, or seems to teach this concept. Uh, it's not in the book of Matthew, it's not in the book of Mark, it's not in the book of John, it's not in the book of Acts, uh, it's not in all the writings of Paul. The Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, never taught anywhere that the soul of a lost person who dies goes under the ground to a place of burning. That concept is totally foreign to the teachings of Paul. It's not in the book of Jude, it's not in the book of James, it's not in First and Second Peter, and it's not in the book of Revelation. And that is something to ponder. It, there is one place, however, which is in Luke chapter 16, which is the main passage that people interpret to mean that a lost soul goes under the ground, leaves his body and goes down at the point of death to suffer. So let's examine this. It's in Luke chapter 16, and it starts in verse 19. Jesus said, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. Verse 20, There was a certain beggar named Lazarus who was laid at the gate, at his gate, full of sores. And Jesus continues and says eventually in verse 22 that it came to pass that when the beggar died, he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died, and he was buried. In verse 23, in hell, the rich man lifted up his eyes, and being in torments, he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame." This is the passage that is quoted from the pulpits of the land. It's referred to in many books. It's uh, talked about by radio preachers, and it's on television. This is the main verse passage that is being used to support the teaching of a hell which is under the ground where people are suffering right now. Now, I'm going to give you seven reasons why? And I think they're good reasons. Now, obviously, you can take them or leave them, but at least think about them. I'm going to give you seven reasons why I believe, and a lot of other people believe, that this section in Luke 16 is actually what the Bible refers to as a parable, and that not every detail was meant to be taken literally. Uh, reason number one is that it starts just like a parable. In Luke 16, Verse 19, Jesus said, there was a certain rich man. Now, when you read the book of Luke, 
when you read chapter 12, verse 16, chapter 13, verse 6, chapter 16, verse 1, chapter 19, verse 11 and 12, chapter 20, verse 9, all of these verses clearly say that Jesus told parables and stories that often started out with phrases like this, there was a certain rich man. I'll just show you one of them. In Luke chapter 19, verse 11 and 12, so you can actually hear it right from the Bible. Luke 19, 11 and 12. The Bible says that Jesus spoke a parable in verse 11. And in verse 12, he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country. So there it's a parable in verse 11. And in verse 12, it's a certain nobleman. And you'll find where Jesus told parables where he said a certain rich man did this or that in addition to what we find in Luke chapter 16. So that's reason number one. It starts like a parable. Reason number two, back to verse 22, there are things in this story that are obviously symbolic. When the beggar died, it says that he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now, you can't take this literally because if you take this literally, that means that the angels took this uh, poor man and deposit him, deposited him into the chest of Abraham. They put him into Abraham's bosom. Now, obviously, uh, that can't be literal, or Abraham would have to have a huge bosom, and why would this man want to be there anyway? So, reason number two, uh, symbolic language is used in verse 22. Reason number three is that the rich man, when he goes down to hell and is suffering, he is described as being uh, not a disembodied soul, but he's described as being in the body with eyes and a tongue. It says in verse 23 that in hell he lifted up his eyes, so he had eyes. And then in verse 24, he pleaded with Abraham to send Lazarus to take, the, uh, take his finger and dip it in water and touch his tongue because he was being tormented in this flame. So he, he's represented as having eyes and having a tongue down there in the fire. Uh, reason number four is a person can't literally talk in fire. And if you don't believe this, just take your finger and put it on a hot stove and try to carry on any kind of a conversation. Uh, it's really impossible for a person to carry on a normal conversation while he is burning in any kind of fire or flames. So that's reason number four, why there's a lot of symbolism in this passage. Uh, reason number five is his request. He, he asked Abraham to send Lazarus and to take the, his, his finger and dip it in water and touch his tongue because he was being tormented in, in this fire. Now, can you imagine, if somebody is literally being burned, if his whole body is burning in fire, uh, why would he request just a little bit of water to touch his tongue? Uh, you know, if you're really burning in fire, you would say, uh, Father Abraham, send Lazarus and have him take a bucket and, and put it all over me, dump the water all over my body because I'm being tormented. Now, there's a reason why Jesus pinpointed the tongue, which I'll explain to you in a minute. So that's reason number five. Uh, reason number six is that Abraham starts talking to the rich man, and the rich man talks back, and they have this conversation. Now, can we literally believe that people in heaven and people in hell can carry on a normal conversation? Uh, you know, that's just not something that, that anybody can, or hardly anybody can actually believe can really happen. Uh, now, reason number seven is that the rest of the Bible, the rest of the New Testament, except for Luke chapter 16, teaches that the fire occurs at the end of the world. That's what Jesus taught in Matthew 13, 40. That's what Peter taught in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 7. That's what Malachi teaches in Malachi chapter 4, verse 1, which we'll look at. That's what the book of Revelation teaches in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. And there are many, many other verses that say this. There's only one place that teaches or appears to teach that people go to hell and burn at the moment of death and that's the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And when you put the pieces together, all the evidence points to it being a parable, and you, can't, you shouldn't build a whole doctrine, especially if the doctrine is different from the rest of the Bible, on one story. It just doesn't make sense. Now, uh, if it is a parable, then is it, is it a meaningless parable? When, once we say it's a parable, does that mean that it has no lessons for us today? Uh, not at all. When you look at the context in Luke chapter 16, and you look at verse... 14, here's the context, 13 and 14, Jesus was talking to a group of Pharisees about how you can't 
serve God and money at the same time. You just can't do it. And in verse 14, the Bible says that the Pharisees also who were covetous, they loved money, they heard these things and they, they mocked him. They mocked Jesus with their tongues. And then in verse, in verse 15, the Bible says that Jesus said to them, he was talking to rich Pharisees who loved money, who were mocking him with their tongues, and who also believed that because they were rich, they were definitely going to heaven, and because uh, you know, poor people didn't have any money, they were probably going to hell. And so Jesus told this story to them about a certain rich man who went down, the poor man went up, he reversed uh, what they previously thought, and then the rich man who was in the fire looked up and, and asked Abraham to send Lazarus to take his finger and dip it in water and touch his tongue because he was being tormented in this fire. And Jesus was talking to the rich Pharisees who were mocking him with their tongues, basically trying to give them a solemn warning that their tongues were going to lead them into the fire if they weren't careful and didn't come to believe in him and in his true teachings. So put the pieces together and I think the evidence, I believe, I'm certain, uh, I'd stake my life on it, that the evidence is there that this story is a parable and again, let's look at the rest of the Bible and see what the rest of the Bible teaches about the hot topic of hell. Let's look at some other verses. Let's go back to Revelation 20, which we looked at in part one. Revelation chapter 20 again describes the events that occur at the end of the, at the, end of the millennium, the end of the thousand years, and it tells us what will happen to the lost, how they will eventually be cast into the lake of fire. And let's look at where the fire takes place. In Revelation 20 verse 7, the Bible says, when the thousand years are expired, so this is the end of the millennium, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. He will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. This is all the lost at the end of the millennium who are being led by the devil to try to fight against God. Verse 9 says, they went up on the breadth of the earth, so they're on the earth, and we've already, well, we didn't read this uh, today, but in the previous program we did, that the end of the chapter reveals that they've been resurrected. And it also says the same thing in verse 5, the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So all these people are resurrected, they're on the earth, and verse 9 says they are going up upon the breadth of the earth, and they surround the camp of the saints about, which is the New Jerusalem, called the Beloved City, and then it says that fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So uh, the question is, where are they when the fire comes down upon them and they are punished? And the answer is, they are upon the earth. That's what verse 9 says, they went up on the breadth of the earth. So they're not under the earth, they're on the earth when the fire falls. Another point is that the fire comes down from God out of heaven and verse 9 says that fire devours them. Look up the word devoured in a dictionary and it's pretty clear that it's a complete destruction. So this is the end of the thousand years. They're on the earth. The fire comes down from God out of heaven and it devours them. Now to be fair, and I always want to be fair, verse 10 seems to say something different. Verse 10 says, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now here's one of those forever and ever texts that people look up, they look at verse 10 and they say, Steve, don't you understand the Bible says that the lost will burn forever and ever. That's what verse 10 says. Now we really have a dilemma here that we need to explore and try to unpack and understand. In verse 9, John wrote that fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And then verse 10 talks about them being, or at least the beast and the false prophet, being tormented day and night forever and ever. So now let's, let's move into the, the, um, the consequences and how long this fire burns. Does it devour them and so they're gone? Or does it burn forever and ever and they are tormented in this fire forever and ever? Which one's right? Verse 9 or verse 10? Now, there are some pastors that believe in verse 9 and they say, no, God's going to just devour them and they're going to be gone and that's it. And the other pastors look at verse 10 and they say, no, they're going to be tormented day and night forever and ever. 
So a lot of people sometimes debate this subject, which really is what we're doing. We're looking at both sides, trying to figure out which view is right. So which view is right? Well, let me say that I believe in the whole Bible. I don't believe one verse is wrong and one verse is right. I believe both verses are right. And let me, before I give you my opinion on this and take a close look, let me ask you, which verse do you like better? Which concept do you like better? Do you like the idea that the lost will eventually be gone, that they'll be devoured, burned up, and they won't suffer forever? Or do you like the fact that they will be tormented forever and ever? You know, think about your relatives. Think about those that you know that don't know Jesus. Think about the, the, the masses of humanity. Would you rather have them just be gone at the end of the world because they didn't love God and God just pulls the plug on their existence and it's over? Or would you rather have them suffering for all eternity? Well, I would hope that our humanity uh, would say that we really would like uh, it to be uh, the first option, that those who don't believe in Jesus, that eventually God does what only a loving God can do. He just finally uh, lets the punishment fall on them according to what they deserve, and then that's it. It's over and they're gone. But we really can't base a doctrine on what we like better, obviously. You know, if I like the idea that they're going to be gone, uh, but that's not true, then I need to follow the Bible, not just what I like. And on the other hand, if you like the fact that, or believe that people are going to burn forever, but that's really not what the Bible really says. When you look at, when you look at the whole Bible, then you need to adjust your course and stick with Scripture as well. So back to the text. How do we interpret these verses? Well, let me make a very important observation, which you can find in your own Bible, and that is in verse 9, there is absolutely no symbolism in the text. Verse 9 simply says, they surrounded the new Jerusalem, fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. No symbolism. Verse 10 talks about the beast, which has seven heads and ten horns, and the false prophet, and they're tormented day and night forever and ever. So bottom line, verse 9 has no symbolism, verse 10 clearly does. And to me it's significant that uh, every passage in the book of Revelation that describes torment day and night forever and ever, they always have symbolism. A couple quick examples. Uh, Revelation 14, 11 talks about the beast and people being tormented day and night forever and ever. Same thing, symbolism. Revelation 19, verses 2 and 3 talks about the harlot. And this is a woman named Mystery Babylon described in Revelation 17. She's riding a seven-headed, ten-horned beast. Uh, and it says that her smoke goes up forever and ever, which is obviously, again, a reference to a symbolic woman. So my point is that every reference in the book of Revelation, whether it's, cha whether it's chapter 20, chapter 14, 11, or chapter 19, 2, and 3, always tormented day and night forever and ever is connected to symbolism. Now let's take a look at some other verses that have no symbolism and are very, very clear. Ma uh, Malachi chapter 4. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. And notice what Malachi says about the end of the world. Malachi chapter 4, the Bible says, Behold, the day is coming that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud and all that do wickedly, they will be stubble. And the day that is coming will burn them up, saith, not Steve Walpert, but saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. So God himself says that on the final day, those who do wickedly will be burned up. That's what he says, and there'll be no root left or no branch left. Now, picture a tree or a plant. If you burn up the root and the branches, how much of it is left? There's nothing left, nothing at all. Verse 3 says that the wicked will become ashes under the feet of the saints on that day when God does this. So here it says there'll be ashes. Not only that, but if you go to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28, it describes the devil. Ezekiel 28 is very clear. This is talking about Lucifer. It says in verse 15 that he was perfect in his ways from the day that he was created until iniquity was found in him. That's when Lucifer became a devil. Verse 17 describes his heart being lifted up in pride. And then verses 18 and 19 describe what God is finally going to do to Satan. Verse 18 says that God will bring a, forth a fire and it will devour you and I will bring you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all those who behold you. 
and all the people, um, all those among the people shall be astonished at you, and you will be a terror, and never shall you be any more. Now, think about this. I mean, look, look at the text. It's very clear. God is clearly talking about Lucifer himself. It says the fire is going to devour him, and he's going to become ashes, and never will he be anymore. He'll be gone forever. And I feel like saying, uh, and all the people said, and I'd like to hear a big amen. Uh, one of these days, the Bible says Lucifer himself is going to be gone. He's going to be uh, consumed by fire, and he'll become ashes, just like Malachi says in chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. There are many other verses that teach this. Let's look at Jude chapter 7, or actually verse 7. There's only one chapter in the book of Jude. Jude 7 describes the suffering of the lost at the end of the world and parallels it to Sodom and Gomorrah. Jude verse 7 says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, they are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now some people say, look, Steve, it says eternal fire. And my response is, but look closer. The context is Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible says Sodom and Gomorrah were burned in fire, with eternal fire. But there are other verses in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, it says that Sodom and Gomorrah were turned into ashes by that fire. When the Bible says it was eternal fire, it doesn't mean that it burns forever because Sodom and Gomorrah aren't burning today, but it simply means it was a fire from God that did an eternal job and it burned those cities to ashes and they're done. And verse 7 says that this is an example of what is going to happen to the lost. Let's go back to Revelation. In Revelation chapter 20, we already read that there is a final resurrection, there's a day of judgment, and then the lost will be thrown into the lake of fire for their punishment at the end of time. Verse 15, 2015 says, whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, the very next verse says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. So right after the wicked are seen going into the lake of fire, then there's a scene change, there's a new heaven, there's a new earth, and everything changes, everything passes away. Verse 4 says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there will be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. Verse 5 says, He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Now think about it. If those who are, who are thrown into the lake of fire uh, burn forever and ever and ever, then chapter 21, verse 4, can never come true. There will always be pain, sorrow, suffering, and crying somewhere in God's universe. But the Bible says it's not going to happen. That after Satan, the lost, and his evil angels are all consumed and become ashes in the lake of fire, then there will be a new heaven, a new earth, and all sin will be behind us forever. And then there will be no more pain in God's universe, no more suffering in God's universe, no more crying in God's universe, uh, no more sorrow at all. It'll all be over. And God himself, sitting on the throne, said, Behold, I make everything new. Uh, I was once in New Jersey holding a Bible seminar teaching on this topic. And there was a young man named Corey, a Jewish man who was coming to the meetings. And he came to one of my talks on the hot topic of hell. And I went through these verses. I showed clearly. And I showed John 3.16 that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, perish but have everlasting life. And I quoted also Romans 6, uh, 23 that says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And I showed him all these verses that those that don't want Jesus and don't want God and don't have their sins forgiven, that eventually uh, they'll be gone. They will be punished appropriately according to their sins, and then they will become ashes, and then God will remake the heavens and the earth, and everything will be perfect and full of love and goodness just like in the beginning of time. And Corey sat in the audience, and when that meeting was over, he came up to me, and his face was just glowing. And he grabbed my hand, and he said, Steve, Steve, he said, now, now I can believe. I can believe in a loving God. Uh, 
And then he went home, and the next night he came back to the meeting, and his face was again glowing. And he said, Steve, he said, last night I got on my knees, and I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And I opened my heart to him, and then he said, he said, Steve, praise God, I'm born again. I'm born again. And I was so excited. At the end of that meeting, he was baptized. And his Jewish mother was there, and she said, uh, I don't know what's happened to Corey, to my son, but uh, I can tell it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And the doubt and uh, barriers were removed from Corey's mind once he knew the truth about hell, the truth about the fire, the truth about what God's going to do at the end of the world, and how one of these days all sin and suffering and sorrow and pain will be gone forever. And Corey became a believer in Jesus because of that. Dear friend, I hope that you will take a close look at your Bible and discover the truth about our loving God, about our Heavenly Father, about our Savior Jesus, who loved the world so much that he gave his own life on the cross to save us from sin. And those who don't believe in him, who continue to reject him, eventually they will perish and they'll be gone and they won't have eternal life. But those that love Jesus and love God because he's good and loving and kind and just and perfect, they will live with him forever. The Bible says in Revelation 20, verse 5, that God says, Behold, one of these days he will say, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. You have just heard his voice today. We hope you've enjoyed this timely message from Pastor Steve Wolberg, and we want you to know that Whitehorse Media is deeply committed to bringing you many more simple messages straight from the Bible, designed to educate the mind, inspire the heart, and help bring our viewers and their families closer to God. To learn more about Whitehorse Media, or to watch more of Pastor Steve's television programs online, including his powerful new series of two-minute talks, visit hisvoicetoday.com. That's hisvoicetoday.com. If you have any prayer requests, you can email them to us at prayerrequests at hisvoicetoday.com. If you would like a free copy of Steve Wolberg's audio CD, Behold a White Horse, you can call us at 1-800-78-BIBLE. That's 1-800-78-BIBLE. We hope you will join us next time for another inspiring His Voice Today presentation with Steve Wolberg. The Bible teaches that hell is real, but is it burning now? Are its flames crackling somewhere beneath our feet? Steve Wolberg's pocketbook, The Hot Topic of Hell, separates biblical truth from popular myths. To request your free copy, call us at 1-800-782-4253. You may also write to us at Whitehorse Media, P.O. Box 130, Priest River, Idaho, 83856, or online at whitehorsemedia.com.